Blue Origin made kind of a surprise announcement. I don't think many people knew this was coming. They just announced kind of quietly saying they can build solar panels on the moon. And meaning they have a technology they think they, they, think they can do it with. They've, they've done the process on Earth. Obviously, they need to test it in space to make sure it works in low gravity, test it on the moon to make sure it works with, it, with air conditions. But the key thing is they could build them just using the regolith, which is dirt. You don't call it soil because the soil tends to imply you have microbes and stuff, which, which you don't have. Just regolith. And that's an example of using in situ resource utilization, living off the land. And ultimately, it's something we really have to do well if we're going to get to space and, and live there in any quantity. Um, you know, if we want to have many people there, you can't just supply everything from Earth. So, one of the keys to settling the rest of the universe is living off the land. And this is a start. Making solar cells, it turns out, that's actually an old idea going back to, well, at least the 90s, well, when people started worrying about, you know, silicon chips and that sort of thing and realizing, oh, you got all those things in the crust. But let's talk about briefly about why you want to do this. Here's an example. This is a typical picture. This is out of the European Space Agency, kind of a vision of a moon base. And, you know, yeah, it looks pretty cool. You know, you got, you got some people there, you got some you know, solar power, you got, you're growing some stuff. One thing that's basically wrong with this picture is that, well, it, it's inevitable you'll start off like this, but the question is, can you stay like this? Basically, everything you see in this picture came from Earth. Now, the one exception, they made some use of local materials. They did bury the habitats a bit um, with the regolith. You can see that in the, 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 the lower, the upper right side there. They bury that habitat and part of the one next to it. And that, that's actually like the simplest possible in situ resource utilization. You can't get simpler than that, but it's actually essential. For one thing, it provides an insulating layer. You know, it gets very, very hot and very, very cold, depending on whether you're in the light or at night on the moon. And the other thing is you need it for radiation protection. You need both of those things. And so that's the one thing they're doing there that uses that. Now, the other thing that maybe they've done a little bit of local utilization is you can't really tell what's going on in that little agricultural area there. You know, maybe it's all hydroponic. It looks like maybe not. So maybe they figured out, uh, you know, some way to use a regolith um, as dirt, you know, so you don't have to bring all the dirt from Earth as well. You can't tell in this picture. But so the fundamental problem is, this is great. This is sort of the Antarctica model. Um, you know, basically the South Pole Station is out there by itself. It depends completely on resupply from the rest of Earth. And that's kind of how the space agencies around the world have traditionally viewed going to space. They imagine setting up a little research post somewhere that has to be supplied 100%, you know, from Earth. We'll never get, we'll never get a significant number of people in space if that is the only part of the model. So the real question is, how do you scale up something like this? If you want to put in twice as many people, you've got to ship twice as much stuff. And then you've also got to maintain it with parts from Earth on the long term, you know, to replace those solar cells eventually. So that's why people have talked about making solar cells on the moon. It's attractive because we know the ingredients are there. Everything you need is there. You got 20% silicon in a typical regolith. 10% of it's aluminum. So silicon you need for silicon-based chips of all types, you know, whether any kind of semiconductor, whether it's solar cells or whether it's a, a CPU. The aluminum you can use for structural use, and of course you can also use it for wiring. So you got, you got pretty much everything you need just right there. It's mostly tied up with oxygen. 40 to 45% of the crust is oxygen, meaning Aluminum, silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide, and then there's smaller amounts of iron, uh, titanium, a, very, a variety of other uh, rare earth kind of metals. All those things are there. So those things can be used. Um, and what Blue Origin came up with is they're saying they can actually do it. Now, we talked about why you might want to put solar cells on the moon and have them built there. Obviously, you can increase your, 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 your moon uh, population much more easily if you can source it locally, at least get your energy uh, supplied that way. That's half of it. But the other part that excites people is this may be a cheaper way to get space-based solar power. There's a picture here that this is actually from a Japanese uh, proposal for a particular way of doing it, but they're all pretty much the same in that the sun illuminates basically a whole array of solar cells. They may be connected like this, they may not be, but one way or another, you're, you're illuminating a whole area of them. Typically, you have a panel with some electronics in the middle, and on the back side of that, you re-radiate that as microwave radiation and you focus it you know, back to Earth, or you could do it for Mars for that matter, or on the moon. But anyway, the main thing is you focus it somewhere else. And the reason you wanna do that is it costs a lot less to launch something from the moon than it does from Earth. The gravity is only one sixth. So you can get a, a lot more solar cells up there if you can make them in some reasonable way. Anything you can make on the moon, if you're gonna use it in space, 
it makes sense to source it from the moon or asteroids or somewhere else. But the main thing is don't try to source it from Earth. That's just a whole lot more expensive. So um, the hope is maybe that'll lower the costs for a space-based solar power. So the, their announcement, they had a process they call Blue Alchemist, which allows manufacturing of a complete solar panels, not just the, the cells, but also the glass that covers them, protects them, and the wiring. And it is made, they've tested it with a, a simulant, meaning something that's very much like uh, the lunar regolith. And they've done it since 2021. They say they've been doing this for a year now. And the technology is called molten regolith electrolysis. And what it does is it basically frees that oxygen. You know, we said we have iron oxide, silicon dioxide, and so on. If you heat it up really hot, about 1600 centigrade, which is like a little less than 3000 degrees Fahrenheit, it melts. And if you pass electricity through it, that actually breaks that bonds to the oxygen. And as a result, you can pull out iron, you can pull out silicon and so on. They're saying they can make silicon that's 99.999% pure. So you know that's, that's what you need if you're making semiconductors. There's a certain amount of doping material you have to add in there. I'm not sure if they have to import that or, or they can also find that in there. But fundamentally, almost all of the mass you're looking at, um, they can get. And interestingly, there's no water involved. There's no toxic chemicals or carbon emissions, unlike on Earth, where actually all those things are, <laughs> are needed uh, quite heavily. And anyway, this includes the solar cells. It includes the glass that protects it so they can last maybe 10 years and all the wiring. So that's really in situ resource utilization kind of at its best. Now, that's the good news. And the bad news is they provided no details whatsoever. How much power does it take to, 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 you know, to do the mining? What are the economics of the whole thing? What are the details of the process? We don't know. On the other hand, just the fact that they said it's molten regolith electrolysis, we do actually know quite a bit about that because that's been studied for a while, and I'll get to that later. But the key thing is this has just been done, and it was done independently. Now, so it didn't, or anybody else, nobody else funded this. They just did this on their own. Now they're going to go back and try to get funding from NASA to start integrating it into the various space programs. That's, that's their hope. So then that's when, you know, we'll see, well, does it really work? You know, first of all, you probably try to do it at least up on the space station because that's relatively easy to get to. And then at some point you would try to do it on the moon as well. So let's talk about scaling up. We were saying before, if you want to have more people out there, you know, you need processes that can use local resources. So think about the way this process works. If you have all those solar panels available, you make some more, then you can generate more electrical power, then you can manufacture more solar panels and the whole thing goes in kind of a cycle. And so, you know, the question is, will you be able to just end up covering the whole moon in, in solar cells? Well, no, um, not necessarily. But it does raise the question of you essentially want to look for this, call it a virtuous cycle, if you like, just positive feedback. Once you get it started, the trick is getting it started. And it's a trick because you have to get all that equipment there in the first place. You also have to have enough spare energy available to do the initial melting and, you know, getting the manufacturing process going. And, of course, probably people to help set it up. So really, the limiting factors on this process for just reproducing itself over and over again are, one, the equipment itself. Right now, that would have to come from Earth. And the other thing is, of course, you're going to have human effort in setting it up and probably for maintenance. Nothing stays automated and runs remotely forever. So you need something. So as a result, it's not really likely to be exponential growth because you have these other factors where you still have to bring in uh, from Earth. But it's, it's getting pretty close until you can start manufacturing the equipment itself on the moon. And if you can automate most of the operation, then you're, you're approaching that. And you can generalize this. In general, if you're going to expand into the solar system with people, essentially entire settlements have to replicate themselves. And it's been one of those questions that people have had for a while. You know, how many people, you know, and how much technology is needed that you can actually be, exist pretty much on your own? And then, of course, that also applies. Once you figure that out, once you have kind of a settlement in the box, then you can start reproducing that in other places. And that would certainly be the goal. Uh, short term, that's not going to happen. You obviously would never build things that big anyway, but this was just sort of a conceptual slide. Talking about the in-situ resource utilization, living off the land. As I said, really, settling space is about cost. And SpaceX has gone a long way in reducing cost to get to space. Starship, when that really finally works, they're going to reduce cost quite a bit. That was a necessary condition to actually settle space. But it's not sufficient. You also had to be able to figure out how to live off the land, because even with cheaper launch costs, it's still going to be pretty expensive. You've got to minimize dependence on Earth if you're on the moon or Mars or near asteroids anywhere. And that will enable you know, expansion into space. So we've talked about uh, a lot of these other examples in the past. Getting oxygen out of the Martian atmosphere, that was a test that was done on the Perseverance rover, just because that was there. It was about the only shot at getting it. So they proved that they can do that. You know, that's, that's, there's a possibility there. The atmosphere is carbon dioxide. 
almost exclusively, you can break the bonds of that carbon and oxygen and pull out the oxygen. We talked last month about mining asteroids. And actually, we talked earlier about some lunar processes as well for doing that. Other examples, taking water. There are deep craters at the lunar south pole that probably have water ice in them. There's enough evidence that you can actually get that relatively easily. And of course, you obviously need it for drinking, but also you can electrolyze that to make oxygen and you can react it further. Well, you can use the oxygen as propellant in a rocket and you can react it further for other chemicals. Even at a more basic level, just paving, building structures and protection from radiation. That's an obvious use of in-situ resource utilization. Those are probably the first things that would be done. And yet, to make a side comment, the main manned space programs don't even plan for that yet. It's almost like there's two parts to NASA. There's the part that does the big showy projects, like getting people to the moon and then on to Mars. But they don't actually use any of this stuff. They're just kind of assuming the Antarctic outpost kind of a model. And then there's all these other research that NASA is funding for doing all this other kind of stuff, the ISRU, which ultimately is going to be a lot more important than the showpiece, get an astronaut to Mars kind of thing. Well, agriculture was one more example, just turning regolith into usable soil. So how do we do the regolith electrolysis? What the heck is that? This is what uh, Blue Origin is using, and it turns out there's another Houston company that is actually doing this too. It's a variation on something called molten salt electrolysis. It's been around for 100 years, and it's used for aluminum, uh, magnesium, and rare earth metals. Uh, not all of it, but it is a significant process in all of these. The idea is, in their case, you have molten salt, meaning it has to be pretty hot to be molten in the first place, and you pass electrical current through a bunch of ore that is submerged in that salt. And the electricity, just like we're talking about with Blue Origin, it breaks down the oxygen bonds to the metals. And one way or another, you end up pulling out the, the metal. So the Earth applications, of course, they don't care about the fact that you're freeing up oxygen. That just goes out to the atmosphere. Or worse, actually, because they use anodes and cathodes, the anodes that they use are made of carbon. And actually, they end up generating CO2. So actually, it's, it's kind of bad that way. This has been studied. Uh, this process has been studied uh, for use that way. The European Space Agency, for some reason, went into that approach. And they're looking at using calcium chloride as the salt on the moon. But on the other hand, NASA kind of went a different direction, basically inspired by some MIT research back in the 1990s. Someone just said, just melt the regolith and use that as the ultralight. Don't bother with having salt or any of that other stuff. You don't actually need it. Now, the reactor has to be especially designed to handle this. It has to be kind of self-heating, meaning you pass the electrical current through it, and the heat from that in the electrolysis, that in itself um, is enough. Once the reaction is started, it just keeps on going. But the other issue is, how do you contain something that's 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit? Your average material is not going to hold that. This is something they are borrowing from the aluminum industry. You simply use the ore itself as the outer material, the, the refractory material, which, which protects everything else from the heat. You start heating stuff up, out at the outer edges, it, it, it ends up free, refreezing you know, and solidifying, and that pretty much is your wall. And that, so it's actually easy to contain that way. So what are the technical challenges with this process, though? First thing is that regolith is very high resistance, and that's true even when it's molten. So for instance, it's a lot worse when it's cold. I mean, if you take your average rock, you know, you try to plug it into the wall, you take some wires out of the wall and you try to short out those wires with a rock, you're not gonna heat that rock up because the resistance is too high. You just, you know, you won't get enough current going through it to do anything. So starting the whole process up, that's tricky. So the cold start says you have to have a lot of energy there to get the whole process going to get it hot enough in the first place. Then, of course, the molten material is a problem. What do you do with it once you've got it? Now, the, this diagram here shows, on the right-hand side here, shows the way things work. you got electrodes basically at the top and the bottom. Think of this thing as a cylinder with a, a big plate on the top and a big plate on the bottom. And one end of it, you get oxygen coming off. In this case, it's at the top on the anode. The other end, you're forming, you're getting the oxygen out of the iron or silicon in this case. And so it's falling to the bottom. So you have essentially liquid metal down here. So you got to figure out how to get it out. And that actually, although I've, I've looked through a few, just skimming, you know, some of the papers that have come out on this stuff. That turns out that's, that's a tricky step. You know, how do you do that? You could do it as a batch. You know, you can heat the whole thing up and then just let it all cool back down. That's incredibly inefficient from an energy standpoint. You put all that energy into heating stuff up and then the cooling it back off. But everything has been done pretty much in a lab scale on this molten regolith technique. So that, that's still a, a problem for, their, for them. You'd want to have some kind of a pipe or something to let the uh, liquid metal come out, but what do you make that pipe out of? 
they're still working on that. That's sort of a not, you know, not really completely solved problem. And that's why you wonder, well, what is Blue Origin doing? They apparently are claiming they've solved some of this stuff. So yeah, life of the electrode is an issue. Separating the products. In the case of most of the other processes for aluminum and so on, they use salts that, are, that specifically absorb what they want, like aluminum. Here, you're going to end up getting iron and silicon and everything else. you got to separate that stuff somehow. And, and nobody says how they're doing that. It's really not very clear. And then, as I mentioned, uh, batch processes, not very efficient. They want to do it continuously. Again, not clear. So there's a lot unknown, really, about what Blue Origin is saying. But they're not the only company doing this. There's a company called Lunar Resources. They're here in Houston. They're also doing this. And they are going out. Uh, maybe on, in 2024, they are sending a prototype reactor to the moon. And its goal is basically metal extraction, iron, aluminum, magnesium. They've done this with private capital and with funding from the National Science Foundation and NASA. So they've gotten funding for this. As I said, 2024 is their goal. This thing you're looking at here, the, what they call the reactor, which is where the reactions would occur, is about a meter, you know, three feet uh, diameter and height. And what they would do is they would collect the regolith with a, a small rover. Their goal is to process maybe 100 kilograms in 24 hours. To do that, what has to get delivered to the moon is about half a ton. And they think the Griffin Lander, which is one of the moon lander uh, companies that's working on this, they've been working with them, and this is their vision of what it's going to look like. So you have the Griffin Lander. That's a general purpose thing for getting stuff down to the moon softly. And then they're expecting a rover to move the regolith around. NASA is apparently providing that with some other project they're doing. The excavation and the truck, they're two separate devices, but apparently NASA is doing these with some other companies along the way. But what you're looking at in the center of this picture then is their processing units. And what's amazing to me is they have some solar cells there. That doesn't look like a whole lot. Apparently they're doing only a small amount of work. Remains to be seen, but at least they're testing this whole thing out.